FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today's April 5th, 2017. The first quarter is gone, but some things are more important. We're looking back on history right now. Uh, there's a book out. I'm in the midst of um, actually listening to it on Audible. As sometimes I just don't have time to read the paperbacks anymore or the Kindle version. Uh, the book is entitled The Spider Network, The Wild Story of a Math Genius, A Gang of Backstabbing Bankers. That's a little I think he repeats himself, and one of the greatest scams in financial history. And the author is David Enrich. David, you're Wall Street Journal's uh, award-winning business reporter, and it's really great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Hey, so obviously working for the Wall Street Journal, you're no stranger to to uh, characters, to eccentric, crazy, corrupt people, uh, to vulgarians, if you will. And you put out this book. It's really a great book. I mean, it's almost, I'm listening to it and it almost doesn't sound real. Uh, where'd you come up with the concept for it? Well, first of all, that was, I'm glad to hear that it sometimes doesn't sound real because that was one of the goals for this to read, even though it is nonfiction and everything is factual and accurate to, for it to read in an entertaining way, kind of like a novel would. And uh, the idea for this came because I had been based in the Journal's London office for several years and was looking into all sorts of uh, financial shenanigans that were going on there. London has been the hub for some of the world's worst behavior in the banking industry. <laughs> and it, the LIBOR scandal is something that had been kind of simmering on the back burner for a long time. And LIBOR is uh, it's an acronym, the London Interbank Offer Rate. And it, it often describes as the world's most important number because it is the basis for interest rates that everyone pays on mortgages, on credit cards, on student loans, auto loans. It's the basis for interest rates people pay or for the companies pay when they borrow money or towns and cities pay when they borrow money. And so uh, the scandal is that a uh, number of banks, traders at banks, had figured out a way to manipulate this on the fringes and in a way that would enhance their profits and basically with no regard to how it would affect everyone else. And a lot of other people had the potential to really get hurt on this. And this all sounds very dry and not that interesting. And then along comes this guy who is basically uh, painted by prosecutors as the ringleader of the scandal. And it's a guy named Tom Hayes, who is a mildly autistic mathematician. And he was a star trader for a succession of the world's biggest banks and making a ton of money for them and heavily recruited by one bank after another, the likes of Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, banks of that caliber. And one of his biggest attributes as a trader was that he had figured out a very clever way to manipulate things, to benefit himself and benefit his institution. And that's something that was, at the time, very much encoded in the DNA of the banking industry. That's something that the banks encouraged their employees to do. It was really almost a prerequisite for being good at your job. And so the idea for this book, to get back to your original question, is that I got to know Tom Hayes very well, very shortly after he was criminally charged in the U.S. Uh, in the years leading up to his trial, which took place in 2015. And I developed uh, in a, a pretty close relationship with him, I would say, and got to know him and his family really well. And it also got to see a lot of the evidence that was the prosecutors had assembled in this case. And it became this, it, it kind of transformed from being a story about just this evil financial villain who tries to manipulate something to being a story about how the financial system more or less encourages this type of abuse. And there are all these colorful characters, not least of whom is Tom Hayes, that get caught up in this in a way that to me, as someone who had covered this for a long time, was actually really surprising to see how the system basically built these people up into uh, people who would later be described as very bad actors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they're not really nice people either. I mean, they're funny in their um, eccentricities, but they're very vulgar. They're abusive to one another. They really do remind me of characters from the Wolf of Wall Street, except they're yep. in a much more elevated. They're at Goldman Sachs. They're not at Stratton Oakmont, but they're, they're the same people. Yeah, it's just definitely the a lot of these people. I, t I totally agree that they're not nice. Niceness is not a word that uh, translates into 
much success on Wall Street, to be honest with you. And these are people that are, you know, they come from all different walks of life. Some are pretty well educated and come from affluent backgrounds. Others never graduated from high school, much less college. And what unites them all is that they're good in different ways at looking for different edges to exploit in the financial system. So for Hayes, who is really gifted at math, he, in, can, he this is the kind of guy who's going to do like complex equations in his head. And so he's very, in the, he's very good at programming and computing and spotting patterns that occur in the financial system. Others are really good at, um, you know, they're very social and are good at establishing relationships, which is something, incidentally, that Hayes is almost uniquely bad at. It's extremely socially awkward. And But all of them are in it for the same thing, which is to win and to make as much money as quickly as possible for themselves and for their institutions. And that's basically been the MO of Wall Street and of the banking industry all over the world for the past couple of decades. And it's a recipe that... We see this over and over again. It translates into either crises or scandals or just a lot of bad behavior, which is this book is overflowing with bad behavior. You're not going to come away from the book liking very many of these people. I mean, they're they're on these jaunts, these junkets with prostitutes, uh, you know, with uh, nonstop flowing uh, bottles of crystal, of champagne, of rare wines, all being paid by somebody. Who pays for this in the end? I mean, basically, who's the ultimate uh, payee or, or payor for all of their bad behavior? Well, I mean, it depends exactly. You, you could cut it in numerous different ways. I mean, obviously, a lot of these institutions ultimately get bailed out in the financial crisis. And so you and I and all the other taxpayers end up on the hook to some extent. The interesting thing, though, one of the things that really attracted to me that, to this story is that, and this is a bit of a spoiler alert, but since this is all nonfiction, I think that's OK. The story ends and someone goes to jail. And that person is Tom Hayes. He gets a very long prison sentence. And as far as I can tell, he is the only person or the only person connected to the banking industry, I should say, who's currently in prison for crimes committed during the financial crisis. And that just struck me as really remarkable because this is, you know, after the financial crisis, there was enormous public pressure on politicians and prosecutors to find some individuals to hold accountable for all of the misdeeds, all the crimes that took place during the financial crisis and all of the harm that was done to the economy and to the country and to the world, really. And prosecutors, to me, the re- the anticipatable reaction to that would be to find some senior executives to hold accountable, whether it's CEOs or other business leaders or chairmen. These are the guys who are responsible for establishing the culture of these institutions and in, to a large extent being in charge of the policies and practices that occur underneath them. And that's not what happened at all. Instead, what happened is prosecutors went after a fairly small group of fairly low-level individual traders and bankers who had definitely done things wrong. I mean, Hayes is not, does not come out of this smelling good. But he also doesn't, to me at least, doesn't come out of this looking like kind of the prototypical evil guy out of central casting. This is someone who is he's like a deeply troubled individual and a deeply flawed individual, but it's someone who is right now paying the price for an entire industry's era of awful behavior. And that doesn't seem fair, and it, doesn't, it also doesn't seem effective. I mean, that doesn't seem like a good way to deter or prevent future bad behavior. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, the the heads of these banks all got to retire, or they're still working there, but they got big pensions, multi-million dollar pensions. They never had to pay anything towards this. And yet, uh, they're supposed to be responsible for these people who are working under them, and they're supposed to be monitoring their actions, right? I mean, if... In, that's theoretically true. Yeah. And yet... I mean, the... the <laughs> The, the reality, obviously, is a lot different, and that's something that I think, uh, you know, we see this pattern repeating itself over and over again. And we also see this as hey, this is increasingly becoming a political issue, I feel like, because, you know, we saw this in the recent election with obviously Trump rode a big wave of anger at, among others, the financial elite. I think Bernie Sanders on the Democratic side also uh, was very effectively tapping into this. And it, reporting and then writing this book, I get why people are angry about this because it's, you know, there's, there was so much damage caused by the actions of the banks and the financial industry overall. And yet, as you said, there are a lot of these guys paid no price, not even a financial price for what happened. And in fact, some of the characters in the book who knew about at best 
or at, I'm sorry, at least knew about what was going on, and in some cases uh, apparently condoned or even participated in what was going on in this scam, not only didn't lose their jobs and didn't get punished, but have continued to be promoted through the banking industry and currently are in senior positions at major global financial institutions, while others lower down the food chain are in prison. Yeah, yeah something uh, not right about that, but it's just like the the guy who robbed somebody you know, mug somebody on the street at gunpoint, he gets uh, 10, 15 years. The guy who does it with electronic means generally only does it a year or two. So, so Hayes was different though. I mean, he got a lengthy prison sentence. Uh, was that supposed to send a message out to all the other traders that, uh, you know, this could be you? I think that's the idea, that there, the Justice Department and the prosecutors in the UK as well were trying to signal that they were really serious about cracking down on financial crime and that traders who are, you know, in the popular imagination especially, are kind of these wild, uh, this wild bunch that doesn't really obey the rules. And there's some validity to that perception. But and again, Hayes, part of the reason that Hayes got caught and got punished so severely is because he was really naive about a lot of what he was doing. And he was, this is someone who was doing all of his illegal activity in writing. He was asking people to do things on his behalf through instant messages and through electronic chats, sometimes over recorded phone lines, but not in a way that is conducive to getting away with your crime. And that not only was naive at the time, but in a, a lot of people regard that as very naive, but it also represented a treasure trove of evidence for prosecutors when they got around to investigating this. And so Hayes was almost uniquely easy to capture and then to uh, convict. And it, that, again, to me, speaks to the approach that prosecutors all over the world have taken since the financial crisis, which is that they are terrified of losing important cases. And they, they judge themselves and they judge each other based in large part on their win-loss records. And, you know, having an, being undefeated, being 98-0 in cases is considered a badge of honor. It's considered a great accomplishment. And what that, that leads prosecutors to take this very conservative approach and very unambitious and uncreative approach to who they're going to prosecute. Because they just don't take any risks because they want to win so badly. So they only go after these ironclad, have kind of low-hanging fruit cases. And that means that over and over again, you see not only the low-ranking guys getting getting charged, but you also it's also people who fit this kind of mildly autistic mold who you see a lot <laughs> getting charged. These are people who aren't uh, they're just a little bit naive about how they're communicating and how they're interacting with other people. And I don't see whose interests that serves. I don't think that's fair. Yeah. So the lesson they're going to get is don't put this stuff down in writing so that you can get caught, right? And uh, and don't leave a trail if you for do the prosecutors. Use some sort of encrypted app or some disappearing yeah. message app or something like that that's just not traceable. That's it's basically it's essentially to be better at concealing what you're doing. Yeah, right. Don't don't make his mistake. So it's an educational lesson that they're getting more so than an ethical uh, education, if yeah. you will. Yeah. So yeah, that's right. And again, to be clear, that's that's not intentional on the part of prosecutors. It's not like they're going out trying to let the bad guys go and just go after like low ranking innocents. These first of all, these guys aren't innocent at the bottom. These are people who did things that are wrong. Generally, knew what they were doing were wrong and probably deserve to be punished. But the fact is that they're going after these low guys, and because those are easy, winnable cases. And I think that's kind of human nature. And that's kind of the incentive system that's been set up for uh, prosecutors that essentially, they're not politicians, but they have some political accountability. And so it's not, I want to be clear that it's not saying that this is something deliberate or intentional on their part. It's just, I think it's an inadvertent consequence of the way the system has been set up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the incentives for prosecutors have incentives just like traders do. And while they don't get cash bonuses for putting these guys in jail, um, their future careers are dependent upon their one lo their win loss records. Uh, while they're uh, while they're in the U.S. Attorney's office, it's kind of the reality what you see on that uh, on that TV show Billions, which is loosely based on Preet Bharara's uh, tenure right. as a U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. So what about controls, though, of the big banks? Do you think they've gotten any better at reining in these traders? Because what I've read is that each successive generation of traders is doing new, improved, cutting-edge strategies that the management doesn't have a clue about. They don't understand. 
Yeah, I mean, I hear the same thing. I, I think that in fairness, the banks have gotten better about reining in uh, kind of unruly, uh, dangerous characters. I think the... I just think, but I think over time the industry relaxes a little bit, and so we're still people are still operating with a memory of the financial crisis and a memory of the, all the financial scandals that have uh, rocked the industry over the past decade or two. And I think the danger is that as those memories fade, the beha- the the thing that becomes most prized in Wall Street is again making as much money as quickly as possible. And when that's the prevailing culture and that's a prevailing um, priority. That very clearly, and we've seen this again over and over and over again, that very clearly leads to a certain type of behavior that everyone agrees is undesirable, but there's just certain, there's not always a very strong appetite to deal with it. Yeah, I think that's the problem. As long as they're making money and not losing it, you don't really want to upset the apple cart, right? And if they're not stealing it overtly, then... um, widows and orphans aren't being put out on the street right then who's who's getting harmed right exactly that's exactly right yeah so so i think uh until uh, they figure this thing out uh, we're just going to see, keep seeing more and more of this interestingly enough uh, reading your book on the heels of reading another book by edward thorpe you know a uh, man for all markets so he was never in never worked for the big banks. He ran a hedge fund, a, a number of hedge funds, and was always, at least the way he paints it, you know, was removed from the shenanigans going on, looking for legitimate opportunities. But his firm, Princeton Newport Partners, the Princeton part got busted by Giuliani, as he describes it in Giuliani's pursuit of uh, Michael Milken and effectively wound up having to shut down. So you can get these overzealous prosecutors who in pursuit of one target will go after others, you know, for the greater good, if you will. So I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, you see this in any industry over time that there are the pendulum kind of swings back and forth between uh, very zealous prosecutors and very laissez-faire regulators. And and that's one of the things I've kind of found fascinating in the spider network is that there is a lot of the bad behavior that you see is a direct consequence of decisions that were made decades ago in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s to basically take a totally hands-off approach to monitoring the banks from a, a regulatory standpoint. And that's something that seemed really logical at the time because there was a lot of competition among different cities all over the world to get banks to set up shop in certain cities. So like London, for example, was really eager to attract as many banks to set up headquarters or set up regional headquarters in London. And the way they did that to a large extent was saying, look, we will take from a regulation standpoint, we will be a much lighter touch than what you get in New York. And how does the U.S. respond to that? Well, one way to do it, one way to respond would be to say, that's true. London is lighter touch, but the U.S.'s financial system, part of the source of strength is that it's it is very well regulated. And so that's a source of stability. And you should view that as a positive. Instead, what happened, and this is mostly during the Clinton administration, actually, is we saw this extreme move to just loosen the reins on all sorts of industries in most of all the financial industry. And within that was most of all the derivatives industry within the financial sector. And a lot of people warned at the time that that was going to sow the seeds for the next financial crisis. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, the demise of Glass-Steagall, it really uh, did lay the groundwork. Hey, I'm just reminded, MF Global, okay, John F. Corazine, billion and a half dollars disappears. Nobody knows where it went, but he's politically connected. And as far as I know, nobody at MF Global ever went to jail nothing ever happened there and there there was there was definitely identifiable harm it wasn't this diffuse harm where everybody paid a couple dollars more for their mortgage yep. or their credit cards or whatever so you have to compare the two and wonder who did more harm hayes or corazine and uh, yet corazine never saw the inside of a jail cell and hayes is spending the better part of a decade in one yeah, well, more than a decade, and he yeah. was sentenced to 14 years originally. And uh, 
And again, I mean, just in Corzine's defense, I wouldn't pick I, your characterization of him. I think, even though I haven't followed that all that closely, I think it is accurate. But it's not fair to just pick on Corzine. I mean, the same could be said for any the CEOs of any of the big banks that collapsed during the financial crisis and received big government bailouts. So that's Citigroup, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, Washington Mutual, Wachovia. The list goes on and on and on and on. At countrywide, I mean, and none of these guys were even faced the pros- real prospect of criminal charges. And again, I'm not saying that any of them actually broke the law, but the this idea of CEO impunity is so deeply ingrained in the financial system that I don't think anyone even worries that they might one day be charged. I, I think that's an unhealthily uh, that's really an unhealthy level of confidence for everyone to have. Yeah. You think that's the uh, final uh, lesson of your book? There is that the the little guys. I mean, they're not little guys in the concept. They're not like the little guys in the when they go after you know the mob or whatever, and they wind up arresting some underlings. These were major players, let's face it. They're not minor players at all. But the real major players are the CEOs who allowed this behavior to take place, either wittingly or unwittingly. So the final lesson is the book that they walk, right? Everyone walks except for one person. And that person is not who I think you and I would regard as the only person who deserves to be in a jail cell. All right. Well, hey, it's a great book. I highly, highly recommend it. It's entertaining, aside from everything else. The story of these uh, traders and their their whole infrastructure, the, the hangers-on, the people that live off of them, it's just it's just an amazing look that a peek under the, into the tent that uh, that you really give us here david that's uh, that's rather unique and it's funny as hell as well it's really entertaining so wish you the best of luck on the book well thank and, you uh, thank you very much hey. it's the spider network you can pick it up at amazon or local bookstore yeah any place where fine books are sold and wish exactly. you the best of luck and uh, i look forward to the movie one day <laughs> thanks a lot i appreciate it FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. How the financial system more or less encourages this type of abuse, and there are all these colorful characters, not least of whom is Tom Hayes, that get caught up in this in a way that, to me, as someone who had covered this for a long time, was actually really surprising to see how the system basically built these people up into uh, people who would later be described as very bad actors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they're not really nice people either. I mean, they're funny in their um, eccentricities, but they're very vulgar. They're abusive to one another. They really do remind me of characters from the Wolf of Wall Street, except they're at a much more elevated. They're at Goldman Sachs. They're not at Stratton Oakmont, but they're, they're the same people. Yeah, it's definitely the a lot of these people. I t- I totally agree that they're not nice. Niceness is not a word that uh, translates into much success on Wall Street, to be honest with you. And these are people that are, you know, they come from all different walks of life. Some are pretty well educated and come from affluent backgrounds. Others never graduated from high school, much less college. And what unites them all is that they're good in different ways at looking for different edges to exploit in the financial system. So for Hayes, who is really gifted at math, he, and can, he this is the kind of guy who can do like complex equations in his head. Book. It's really a great book. I mean, it's almost, I'm listening to it and it almost doesn't sound real. Uh, where'd you come up with the concept for it? Well, first of all, that was, I'm glad to hear that it sometimes doesn't sound real because that was one of the goals is for this to read, even though it is nonfiction and everything is factual and accurate to, for it to read in an entertaining way, kind of like a novel would. And it, uh, the idea for this came because I had been based in the Journal's London office for several years and it was looking into all sorts of uh, financial shenanigans that were going on there. London has been the hub for some of the world's worst behavior in the banking industry. 
<laughs> and it, the LIBOR scandal is something that had been kind of simmering on the back burner for a long time. And LIBOR is uh, it's an acronym, the London Interbank Offered Rate. And it, it often describes the world's most important number because it is the basis for interest rates that everyone pays on mortgages, on credit cards, on student loans, auto loans. It's the basis for interest rates people pay or for the companies pay when they borrow money or towns and cities pay when they borrow money. And so uh, the scandal is a, ba- a number of banks, traders at banks, had figured out a way to manipulate this on the fringes and uh, in a way that would enhance their profits and basically with no regard to how it would affect everyone else. And a lot of other people had the potential to really get... FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Today's April 5th, 2017. The first quarter is gone, but some things are more important. We're looking back on history right now. Uh, there's a book out. I'm in the midst of um, actually listening to it on Audible. As sometimes I just don't have time to read the paperbacks anymore or the Kindle version. Uh, the book is entitled The Spider Network, The Wild Story of a Math Genius, A Gang of Backstabbing Bankers. That's a little I think he repeats himself, and one of the greatest scams in financial history. And the author is David Enrich. David, you're Wall Street Journal's uh, award-winning business reporter, and it's really great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Hey, so obviously working for the Wall Street Journal, you're no stranger to to, uh, characters, to eccentric, crazy, corrupt people, uh, to vulgarians, if you will. And you put out this part on this. And this all sounds very dry and not that interesting. And then along comes this guy who is basically uh, painted by prosecutors as the ringleader of the scandal. And it's a guy named Tom Hayes, who is a mildly autistic mathematician. And he was a star trader for a succession of the world's biggest banks and making a ton of money for them and heavily recruited by one bank after another, the likes of Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, banks of that caliber. And one of his biggest attributes as a trader was that he had figured out a very clever way to manipulate things, to benefit himself and benefit his institution. And that's something that was, at the time, very much encoded in the DNA of the banking industry. That's something that the banks encouraged their employees to do. is really almost a prerequisite for being good at your job. And so the idea for this book, to get back to your original question, is that I got to know Tom Hayes very well, very shortly after he was criminally charged in the U.S. uh, in the years leading up to his trial, which took place in 2015. And I developed... uh, uh, in a, a pretty close relationship with him, I would say, and got to know him and his family really well. And it also got to see a lot of the evidence that was the prosecutors had assembled in this case. And it became this, it, it kind of transformed from being a story about just this evil financial villain who tries to manipulate something to being a story about, and so he's very, in the, he's very good at programming computers and spotting patterns that occur in the financial system. Others are really good at, um, you know, they're very social and are good at establishing relationships. It was just something, incidentally, that Hayes is almost uniquely bad at. It's extremely social. <laughs> awkward and but all of them are in it for the same thing which is to win and to make as much money as quickly as possible for themselves and for their institutions and that's basically been the mo of wall street and of the banking industry all over the world for the past couple of decades and it's a recipe that we see this over and over again it translates into either crises or scandals or just a lot of bad behavior which is this book is overflowing with bad behavior you're not going to come away from the book liking very many of these people i mean they're they're on these jaunts, these junkets with prostitutes, uh, you know, with uh, nonstop flowing uh, bottles of crystal, of champagne, of rare wines, all being paid by somebody. Who pays for this in the end? I mean, basically, who's the ultimate uh, payee for, or payor for all of their bad behavior? Well, I mean, it depends exactly. You, you could cut it in numerous different ways. I mean, obviously, a lot of these institutions ultimately get bailed out in the financial crisis. 